This meeting will now come to order. Will the clerk please note the roll. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of November 15th, 2022. Our study session this evening is mid-year financial review. And I will turn it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne to begin. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And yes, we do like to provide a financial and economic update in anticipation of the upcoming budget process, which surprisingly we're going through is the FY 23-24 budget. It's amazing how much time flies. So I'll pass it over to Deputy City Manager Andy Granger. Thank you, Mr. Tyne, Mayor and Council. Um, we've got a lot of information to present to you tonight. Um, we've got uh, Mr. Burke here, our CFO, who's gonna present on the overall national economy and some of the trends that we're seeing and we're looking out for, both good and bad, um, that can have an impact on our local economy. And then when he's done, we're gonna have Mr. Christensen, our Deputy Director over the Budget uh, Division, um, and he's going to present on our some of our local revenue streams, our main uh, revenue streams, which are mainly our uh, local retail sales tax revenues as well as our income tax revenues, and see and give you a, a, an idea of what the trends are there, um, go through our five-year forecast, and then go through some of our, our other major funds and some of the and provide some of the um, an overall health of of those funds. And then lastly, um, we'll give you a recap of how, what we see as far as our financial standing is as, as a city at this point in time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Burke. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Granger. Mayor and Council, uh, good evening. So yes, as Mr. Granger noted, I've got the economic stand, uh, overview to uh, cover. Now I'll just put a disclaimer up front. Uh, there's lots of charts and graphs in here, and so I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, but we'll move along and we'll send the hard copy to Council Member Finn and he can dive into that from there, right? So anyway, but uh, lots of information here, so let's jump right in. I guess the general theme I would say about our economy is it's mixed. We are, we've got many economic indicators, most of them the leading economic indicators, which are those that are saying what's to come, that are showing negative. And so that's certainly not welcome news, but we have some very, we have some other economic indicators that are very positive, and those are ones that are particularly important to the city and give us some good news to hang on to as we go forward. But I would say overall, slightly more pessimism than optimism as we look forward to the economy the next year. The other piece that I would just mention is that we do have a diversified economy in Peoria. We're not a one-segment town. We don't manufacture cars, and while we may be the uh, rose capital of the country, it doesn't drive our economy, right? So anyway, we, uh, <clears throat> we do have a little bit of diversification that helps us. So if we were to look at one economic indicator that tells you the health of the economy, it's usually the gross domestic product. And as you can see, this is not a straight line. This time last year, we were seeing a pretty sizable boom of almost 7% growth in our national economy. That was immediately followed by two quarters of negative growth, right? And everybody was kind of, hey, we're in the recession, the recession's here, we're moving forward. And then what do you know, last quarter we grew again. Uh, we were back in positive territory. Now, in that report, they talked about consumerism and net exports of what drove that positive growth. Consumerism is a good one for us because that means people are still buying things, that generates sales tax, that's good for us. So we'll come back to that, Mr. Christensen, we'll really delve into that in a, a bit more detail. But the theme of the economy has pretty much been inflation, inflation, inflation. Um, we, the reason it's been that way is for the last, we are seeing inflation rates at 50 year highs right now. And that really does hurt the economy and it's a definite leading indicator of unfortunately bad things to come. Now I like this chart from the Wall Street Journal because it really breaks uh, inflation into three components, core, food, and energy. And generally you set aside food and energy because they're already very volatile and any one single event in world uh, politics can set off one of those things. But the core inflation is what they really look at the Federal Reserve and that's been particularly stubborn at over 6%. Now keep in mind, the Federal Reserve thinks 2% is the acceptable level of inflation, and we are at seven and three quarters, so we've got a long ways to go. <clears throat> now, what's worse, that's all right. what's worse is uh, the valley inflation. Um, here in the metropolitan area, we're seeing inflation rates as high as 13%, and we're currently at 12.1. Now, University of Arizona has said the primary driver for this higher level of inflation is shelter, rent, and housing. And that's certainly true. If you look at home prices, 
<clears throat> we have seen a 30% jump in home prices in the last two years. And it doesn't matter whether you're buying an existing home or a new home, the price has jumped significantly. And so I'm going to spend just a little bit of time digging into home prices, um, not because they're necessarily the central part of our economy, but they tell the story pretty well of what's going on in our economy as we go through it. So there's really three reasons home prices have jumped so much. One, back to inflation, the construction commodities. Now, we've seen this every council meeting we come to you with some capital project that has been hit hard by construction materials inflating at 40% or more. And it's the same thing with houses. The materials that make up <clears throat> the construction, lumber, concrete, iron, have all been jumping at astronomic rates. So that's driving inflation for housing. Second is demand. Right? We have seen a population boom in our area. Peoria saw 24% growth in census to census uh, change in population. This is a busy chart, but essentially what it's saying on the left side is that that growth is not coming from natural um, births and deaths. In fact, in Maricopa County, births and deaths are almost even, all right? It's coming from in-migration. It's from people moving into the state, and that's what the right side. So if you think there's a lot more people from California here, that's because there are a lot more people from California here. Um, and I can't ask, like, I'm a native. I moved from Colorado in 2007, so I'm in that top five list that's made my way to better places. But uh, in-migration is definitely driving demand, which is then driving uh, costs. And the last piece has been mortgage interest rates. And you can see for the last two years, we were hovering at this very low level, about 3%. 3% mortgage rates makes homes much more affordable. Unfortunately, that day has gone. We are now at 7%. And so that quick increase has made um, houses much more expensive and contributed to that inflation. And what drives mortgage interest rates? Well, the underlying Fed fund rate <clears throat> that we talk about. This is the rate set by the Federal Reserve Board. As you can see, throughout the entire pandemic, we were running pretty close to zero interest rates. That made things very affordable, and that kept the economy moving. When things got moving too fast and inflation started really spiking, you can see they've been doing nothing but raising rates since then. And this is why we were in a little bit of a hurry to get our bonds sold so that we could get those interest rates before uh, they got too high. So it's close to 4%. The projection is it's going to go to 6 before they are done. What's worse, however, is that the projection is it probably won't drop below 4% for all of 2023. We won't see interest rates come below 4% until 2024. So that definitely slows the economy as we go forward. And back to then to close the loop on housing, we're already seeing that, right? Building permits have been on their way down um, since the beginning of the year. We've been on this pretty steep decline to the point that we're seeing about a dozen building permits for new houses <coughs> per month. And so it definitely is having an effect. Now, uh, at least on the, the home side of it. All right, so let's not, that's the bad news. Let's hit some better news, right? So another leading indicator is consumer confidence. Now this has been kind of in both buckets, the positive and negative as we see. You can see that it's been generally trending down and kind of bottomed out in July at 95.7. Uh, but then this summer, people got a little bit more optimistic about what's coming our way, and we started to see this tick back up. Unfortunately, October turned again, but it's still over 100, which in this particular uh, rating means that people are more in a buying mood than a saving mood when it's over 100. So that's good news. Again, we are all about the, <clears throat> the sales tax, and so when people are buying, that's a very positive thing. So why do they feel positive? Well, they feel positive because they have jobs. And this is probably our best economic indicator for right now, which is that we have extremely low unemployment in the area and in the nation. Uh, economists generally say that if you have unemployment less than 4%, you are at full employment. Meaning, if you want a job, there's usually one out there. Less than that, people are more just trying to find the right job and they're moving around. You can see Peoria got as low as 2.4%. That is. There's jobs out there, if you're looking for it, it's a matter of matching, matching up. What's better is not only do people have jobs, but they're being paid more for them. And so we have seen wage growth, an average of 5% year-over-year wage growth, 
every quarter in 2022. So people are making more money. So what happens when people have jobs and they're making more money? They spend it. Um, and so we are seeing growth in U.S. retail sales. Now, it looks pretty gradual, but recognize the scale here is $100 million per line. Um, so it is a pretty big number when you're looking at retail, U.S. retail sales. But I would tell you, we are seeing notable increases in sales these last few years, and that's very positive. Now, the bad part kind of of this is that People are willing to still spend money despite higher prices, despite that inflation. And unfortunately, that kind of creates a cyclical element that the Fed is very worried about. And so they keep raising the interest rates to get people to slow down and stop paying those higher prices. And unfortunately, what comes from that is they keep going until people start losing jobs. And that's really the concern as we go forward is that while Peoria's unemployment rate is 3.4, it's most likely going to change here in the very near future. And that's kind of what we see on the horizon, particularly for 2023, is increased job losses. And you already see it in the papers. The tech industry is laying off people uh, in pretty large chunks these last couple of months, and it's going to start changing. But for the time being, people have jobs, they're spending money, we're seeing very good revenue trends. Not only do they buy sales tax, but they pay income tax, okay, when they have a job. So those numbers are being very healthy. But our leading economic indicators are negative, housing starts are running low, so there's kind of some bad news. But if you flip back, we're still seeing people coming in, there's still demand for our goods and services, and the, you know, having a major employment agency and TSMC coming on our border, that's still good news in the horizon. So in summary, it's a mix, all right? There is, um, we have some very good financials that we are sitting on, and Mr. Christensen will get into that, but there are definitely clouds on the horizon. And so we just wanna be cautious about that in our planning. And so with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Before Christensen. We, before we move off of the big picture here, I have a question that's been bothering me for a long time. How much confidence can we really have in the Feds uh, playing with this inflation and the interest rates? And I mean, do they know what they're doing? <laughs> Sometimes it seems like they're guessing. <laughs> well, they sure put a lot of data into their guessing. I would say that they, um, they. It's always an, an unknown. It's never a perfect model, and so you know you're playing with something that is so much bigger and complex than any one indicator or even a hundred indicators can give you a perfect model. Um, their mechanism has generally worked in the past for curbing inflation, and that is really what the goal is, is to curb inflation with, in the process, doing as little damage to the employment as possible. And that's why they talked about this soft landing, but it's probably unlikely the more and more as we go that we're gonna have this nice soft landing where we curb the inflation, we see very little job loss and we come back in. It seems to be looking less so on that score. Yeah, and I, I, just to add to that, I think, I think that the difficulty that they have is that when they raise rates, the impact is not seen immediately. It takes months, yeah. if not a half a year, for, for you to see those impacts. So they're raising them because their number one goal is to re reduce that un or the, the inflation down to two to two and a half percent. Um, and, and they know that unemployment's gonna go up and they know that it's gonna kill that home building industry, yeah. but that's their number one goal is to, to reduce that inflation rate. So, and it, and it takes time. So that, that's the difficulty that they have. And I mean, they've got the, the best experts on, on that, that, the reserve board, but um, it's a difficult task. Yeah, I can see that for sure. All right, thank you. That's as much confidence as I'm gonna get. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor. Yes, Brad. Mr. Burke, I, I know that you don't have a crystal ball. None of us do. We all wish we did. Um, I'm seeing some red flags when it comes to the economy, like you mentioned, the interest rate, housing prices, um, unemployment and everything. So with that being said, and, and we all see the economy kind of ebbs and flows. Right. I, I see a valley. You said uh, clouds on the horizon. I see a valley coming. Okay. So as, as policymakers for the city, what recommendations do you have as we kind of forecast uh, the next 12 to 24 to 40 months. Sure. So that's where I'm going to say stay tight because Mr. Christensen is going to uh, attack a good part of that question. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's good to be with you tonight. Uh, like Mr. Burke said, there are uh, gray clouds on the horizon. The good news is that the city is very well 
position financially if that turns into a recession or some kind of a downturn. And I'll talk about what we're doing in our forecast to sort of um, deal with that or plan for it in case that happens. Um, I want to talk first about how our revenues have been performing over the last couple of years and under some of the economic conditions Mr. Burke talked about. This is a pie chart we show you all the time, so uh, it shouldn't be strange to you. The main point here is that uh, two-thirds of our revenues in the general fund, the city's main operating fund, come from just three sources, our local sales tax, state-shared sales tax, and state-shared income tax. A characteristic all these sources have in common is that they're very volatile, meaning that in good times, they perform very well, which I'm going to show you in a minute, but in uh, not so good times, they react quickly to downturns in the economy. So that's always something we keep in mind as we're looking at forecasts and seeing some of these clouds on the horizon. So looking first at our city sales tax revenues, um, this is a 10-year history. If you look at uh, how we are growing between FY13 and FY20, so that's coming out of the Great Recession and before COVID. We averaged about 6% growth in our city sales tax year over year. That's a pretty good rate. It reflects an economy that was kind of coming out of a recession and starting to grow, as well as just uh, people moving into Peoria, the growth that we were experiencing at the time, and obviously have more people spending more money. What we've seen the last two years in our revenue growth is, I would call it unprecedented. Uh, Dina Lund talked about unprecedented construction cost inflation a couple of months ago. What we've been seeing in our revenues the last couple of years is something we really haven't seen maybe ever in the city of Peoria. So in FY21, our city sales tax revenues grew by 14.2% overall. Then we follow that up with a year of 11.1%. That's very strong growth, and that's, that's a lot of uh, revenues coming into the city. We take a close look every single month at how our uh, city sales taxes are performing. This chart shows the last 13 months. You can see between September and April of 20, September of 2021 and April of 2022, the strong revenue growth I was just talking about, a lot of double digits there, a year over year, 12%, 15%. We expected as the Fed began to raise interest rates and, their, and the risk of a recession started to kind of gain some momentum that we would see that growth start to tail off. And we have seen some of that. You see a couple of 3% there in the last three months. But we're still, we still see these little blips of 11% growth and 8% growth, which suggests there's still a little juice in the local economy. How long that'll last, we don't know. But we are starting to see a little bit more erratic um, growth in our revenues and not as high as we had before. So moving on to state shared sales tax, um, if you look at that same time period, I talked about FY13 to FY20, we saw about 4.5% year-over-year growth in this revenue source. Um, but again, in the last two years, we've seen growth like we've never seen before, 18.2% in FY21 and then 39.1% growth in FY22. Now that 39 percent is a little bit misleading because that a lot of that came from this, the new census numbers that we got in Peoria's faster growing growth compared to other incorporated cities in Maricopa County, which increased our share. But it do does also reflect just the, the overall economic strength of the state as well as inflation, which is increasing the price of goods, which helps sales tax. Um, now to state shared income tax, or as it's officially known, urban revenue sharing. This gets a little bit more complicated. Um, first of all, this, the city doesn't receive these revenues until two years after they're collected by the state. So we're looking at actual collections here, and the, the FY22 actuals, for example, are FY20 collections by the state of Arizona. You can see that FY22 enough in FY22 our distribution actually decreased, and that was because of the postponement of the income tax filing deadline during those early months of COVID. Um, oh, let me back up. I'm not done with that one yet. This, the picture for urban revenue sharing is further complicated by what has happened in the legislature the last couple of years. So the bill passed last year 
the flat tax as it's commonly known, makes it difficult for us to kind of estimate where this is gonna land when the impacts of that bill hit us starting in FY 24 and 25. Um, and as we, I'll, we'll, I'll share one scenario of how that might look and then kind of talk through why um, that's tough as a forecaster to kind of work through. So this is a little a tough chart to kind of explain, but those blue bars are what I just showed you. Those are actual income tax collections. The yellow bars in the middle are known amounts that we're gonna receive in 23 and 24, again, because those are based on 21 and 22, so we know what those are gonna be at this point. You can see how much higher they are than where we are in 22. We went from about 25 million all the way up to 38 million in one year. That's a big jump that reflects the, again, unprecedented growth in income tax collections at the state driven by higher wages and just the overall strength of the economy. In FY24, that's growing because of that same growth, but also because the distribution formula between the state and the cities as a result of that flat tax bill is going from 15% to cities up to 18% from cities. So you're seeing another jump there. The orange bars represent what our revenues would be if we applied the state's most recent forecasts of income tax collections. You can see how high that is compared to where we've been even just in the last 10 years. We're very hesitant to set our base at that kind of a level until we know that that's really where it is. So in our forecasts where you're seeing collections in excess of $40 million, we're starting more in the lower 30 millions and then growing it gradually. We'll adjust that as we see actual numbers come in, but we don't wanna over-program our, our revenues and there's some risk of that, not knowing exactly how this is gonna play out. So what are some of the key takeaways from uh, these revenue charts I've been showing you? The first is that as I've said, revenue growth has really been unprecedented in the last two years. It's been driven by really two things. One is people spending down accumulated savings that happened during the pandemic. And the other is inflation, which has driven up wages, given them more money in their pockets, as well as increased the price of goods. All of that helps drive up or increase our income taxes and sales taxes. The growth that we've seen, however, we think should be considered mostly one time instead of the new base that we now grow off of. Um, so in our FY23 forecast, we are holding sales tax revenues flat for FY23. So holding them at, this, at the FY22 levels, just as a, a guard against a potential recession. And because we, we consider the growth we've seen is not really sustainable. And like I said, we're backing off the state's forecast for income tax collections until we know where that's really gonna fall. Um, as I shared, we're still seeing pretty good numbers as far as sales tax collection goes. It's possible that that momentum carries us through the rest of this year and we land in positive territory again, but it's probably equally likely we do get into a recession and we see our revenues go negative. So there's just a lot of unknowns out there in the economy. It's important to mention also that while we're focusing on the, the big three revenues in the general fund, we have literally dozens of other revenues that make up the general fund. Not all of those have been performing like I've been talking about with sales tax and income tax. Things like some of our rec recreation revenues, now our development fees with the development activities slowing, haven't been performing as well. Some of those haven't been adjusted in quite a while, so we are looking at um, maybe some adjustments there to make sure we keep up with the, the added costs that have occurred. So here's a crystal ball that uh, the council member was referring to. <laughs> now that you've seen what's been going on with our revenues, um, let's look at how this translates into forecast going into the FY24 budget process. <clears throat> the, these blue bars represent revenues in our general fund. I know it's hard to really tell here, but these revenues are increasing at kind of a modest rate um, over the forecast, over the five year forecast period. We don't try to predict highs and lows in the economy or you know ups and downs in our revenues. 
Instead, we try to smooth those out over the five-year forecast and keep them at a pretty conservative um, growth rate. When we bring in the expenditure forecast, which is the gold, you can see that revenues are exceeding expenditures throughout the forecast. This is a good thing. We don't want to see the reverse. Um, you can see that also that the gap between revenues and expenditures is higher in the first couple of years and then it levels off toward the end. That's because that's just the nature of um, employee compensation at the city as we program increases every year that naturally grows and so the gap shrinks. We also bring in in year three, that FY26, some large operating impacts of the CIP, um, most notably for fire station number eight. So that reduces that available down a little bit. But what we're seeing with this is that we do have $3 million approximately in ongoing um, financial capacity that could be allocated to new um, ongoing spending with the budget process. We don't necessarily recommend that we allocate every last cent of that given some of the clouds on the horizon. But that is what we show right now is, is what our financial capacity is. Um, the difference between the $3 million there at the end of the forecast and the larger numbers at the beginning, that w would go toward our one-time fund balance uh, per our financial policies. We do have a very healthy one-time balance, even in excess of our required reserves of about $50 million. So there's some flexibility there that we can address um, certain needs or can help us bridge uh, any potential downturn in the economy. Mayor, Council, just a reminder, too, that in the past, uh, especially last year, we used some of that fund balance to draw down our uh, unfunded liability and our public safety pensions, and that may be something that we'd want to do going forward, and that helps protect us uh, to some degree on some of that downturn in the economy also. Next, uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes on talking about the half-cent sales tax fund. This is really an extension of the general fund, but we do forecast and budget for it separately, and it does have its um, very own financial policies in the council-adopted principles of financial management. So this is an important city and this city, uh, an important source of funding in the overall city finances. Sales tax is the only source of funding here, so that's all you're seeing. Uh, again, the growth is very gradual, as I talked about before. Because the, the fund only has one source of revenue, we, we are very careful in this fund not to overcommit things. So the fact that we have a pretty large gap there between revenues and expenditures we consider to be a good thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, you can see that we show available ongoing capacity, and this is only ongoing, I need to make that clear. We're not talking about the the fund balance, this is ongoing revenues versus ongoing expenditures. So we see ongoing capacity of about $6 million in year number one, growing to $9 million by the end of the forecast. This fund, while it does support public safety um, personnel and compensation, it does so through a transfer, a fixed transfer to the general funds. So it doesn't experience the kind of growth and compensation that the general fund does. And that's why you see the ongoing capacity actually ticking up over the forecast instead of going down like the general fund. One of the most important uses for this fund is, as specified in our policies, is economic development. And through the years, we have intentionally kind of retained a lot of capacity in this fund so that council has um, the ability to allocate that if, if an opportunity comes. So, Again, you're seeing a healthy ongoing capacity here. We also have approximately $40 million of one-time um, available dollars in excess of the required reserves for the fund. So a good, healthy picture. So as good as these two funds are, and they are our major operating funds for the daily operations of the city, um, there are good reasons to exercise restraint as we go into the FY24 budget process. As Mr. Burke uh, talked about, economic uncertainty is very high right now, as is the risk of some kind of a recession. We don't know how deep that recession might be or how exactly it would impact the city if, in fact, it materializes. We do know that if there is a downturn, that our sales tax and our income tax revenues will be 
affected and they'll respond negatively very quickly. One particularly concerning risk um, is the threat that one or more of our sales tax categories could be eliminated by the, the state. You probably heard this during the last election cycle. And the, the two categories that are most at risk are the residential rentals and the sales tax on food for home consumption. Combined, uh, those two categories represent $8 million of ongoing revenue just in the general fund and then another $4 million approximately in the half cent fund. So you can imagine if one or both of those things went away, that would pose a significant challenge to the city to sort of rebalance um, our finances. And then finally, general inflation, as we've talked a lot, a lot about already, um, continues to drive up the cost of providing services. So we do expect to see departments come forward in the budget process with additional requests to, to maintain the services they already provide. But the real area where we feel that is in our labor costs. Um, these costs continue to rise as we do our best to kind of keep pace with stay competitive in, in the local market and remain an employer of choice. We do account for those things in our forecast, but we don't always get them exactly right. And sometimes they're more than we expected, as was the case last year. Um, so now some other funds just to, to touch on uh, briefly as I end my presentation. Efficient transportation is an, obviously an important goal of the city. We do have a couple funds that um, specifically address this goal. The Streets Fund, which derives its revenues from the State Highway User Fund, as well as our own sales tax on utilities, um, has traditionally supported street operations and maintenance and continues to do so until this day. But in 2005, Peoria voters also approved a transportation sales tax, um, which also helps our street maintenance, but helps, it supports ongoing transit operations and pays for the majority of uh, streets capital projects. These two funds are in very good shape, they're healthy, and we don't see any reason why they can't continue to support our tran transportation related needs for the foreseeable future. So moving on to our utility enterprise funds. Um, these are, and we're talking about water, wastewater, and solid waste. These funds are facing the most acute financial challenges of any of the funds we've talked about so far tonight. And that's because whereas inflation actually can uh, enhance our revenues in, in the general fund and in half cent fund, that just isn't the case in our utility funds. That requires intervention by the council to actually raise those rates to whatever they need to be. And inflation has hit these funds hard. Solid waste, if you think about it, is really just people, disposal fees, fuel and maintenance. All of those things have gone up significantly over the last year and are putting a lot of pressure on that fund. Likewise, on the water, wastewater side, key inputs like labor, electricity, chemicals, those types of things have all increased significantly as well. But water and wastewater have a much larger well, solid waste doesn't have capital at all, really. Water, wastewater have very large capital programs in both of those. As we all know, construction costs have gone crazy the last couple of years, and that is putting a lot of pressure on those funds as well. And then the drought situation is another source of stress. Um, it's increased our water supply costs. It's led to new capital projects being added to help with redundancy in the system. So all these things combined, are putting a lot of pressure on our utilities. We've done a great job as a city over many years in keeping annual rate increases to below 3%, which is phenomenal. Um, but with the Valley experiencing inflation upwards of 13% in the last year, that's just, we don't see that as being possible going forward. Um, we're early, we've engaged a consultant to work on a rate study. We're early in that process. We'll certainly be coming back to talk to council about that. But we, based on what we're seeing right now, we, we we're seeing an anticipated rate increase needed of about six, anywhere from six to nine percent for FY24 and beyond. So quite a bit higher than what we've seen in the past. So more to come on that. Can I interrupt you? Are we are we continuing to see an offset with recycling? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> That's flipped in the other direction yet again. So. Whereas we are getting savings, we're now again paying for recycling. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. 
I apologize, Peter. It might be a transition for you, but other cities in the <coughs> valley experiencing the same kind of yeah. Tales? Thank you. Um, the good news here is that Peoria does have where we have one of the lowest combined utility rates in the valley. Um, we expect this even with the rate increases potentially that we're talking about that we will remain on the lower end of the spectrum. Every other city, and we've talked to quite a few of them, is experiencing the exact same things. I mean, you just can't absorb 13% inflation without doing something. So that doesn't mean all of them are going to have rate increases in the next year, but we expect many of them will. And in talking to our consultants, the same thing's happening even on a national scale. It's just the reality of, of where we are. So more to come on that, but that's kind of what we're seeing is in the early stages of, of looking into that. One last slide um, before I, I stop here. Um, just want to make a few observations about the capital program since this is a big part of the city's overall budget. Goes without saying that um, capital planning and the environment we're in is pretty tough. It's tough from a financial perspective and it's tough on the people who have to try to deliver the projects in engineering and water services and public works. We continue to do our best and come to council to deal with overages as, as they occur, but it has been tough. Um, the housing slowdown, Mr. Burke mentioned, we really are seeing that in the last three months or so. Permits are really um, much lower than they have been. In the, on the capital side, that translates into lower impact fee revenues, which means we either have to find other sources to make up for that or we push them out in the capital program. We're not seeing, we don't expect to see any um, decrease in our assessed valuation in the, in the near future, but because of cost increases that we're seeing on large geo-funded projects, we do expect to see changes in, in those projects funded out of that source, moving around, moving back, that kind of thing. So expect the 10-year capital program as, as we propose um, in the budget process to look quite a bit different from what we have right now, if only because of the increased costs that we've seen. And then we've talked about voter authorization in the parks area for a couple of years. Um, we are sort of up against it there. We're, we have some left, um, but we're quickly running out. So that could, that could cause some adjustments in projects that are in the, the program currently that may need to come out or be pushed back or, or funded by a different source. And then we, are, we already talked about capital projects as they relate to utilities. So those are the comments I had tonight. Um, with that, I'd be happy to turn the time over to Andy Granger or answer any questions you may have. Yeah, just to wrap up. Um, a lot of information that you got this tonight, um, and thank you, Mr. Burke and Mr. Christensen, for all of that. Some of it positive, some of it negative. I tend to think that um, these two are a little bit more pessimistic. I'm a little bit more optimistic. I don't. I think we're. I know we're financially in really good health, and so if we've got a downturn, as long as it's not a long, steep downturn for a long time, we're going to be we're going to be just fine. Um, because we've got the mechanisms in place to prevent that or to uh, address those, those issues as they come at us. And we'll continue to monitor this. So the next steps is we're going to monitor this as we go through the budget process. This is kind of give you, give you the platform for what we're going to utilize to build our proposed budget that we're going to bring to you in March or April of this year as part of the budget study session. So, um, but um, if you have any questions regarding this, uh, we're here to answer any other questions that you've got. But uh, feel, feel good about the financial condition that we're in at this time. So any questions? No, I think we got it all. No problem. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that presentation. We appreciate all the information. And I'm sure we'll be seeing, we'll, some people will be seeing it all come to fruition in the budget session. So thanks very much. Thank you. Mr. Tyne. Thank you. Mayor Council, that is all we have. I wanted to thank our staff, Mr. Granger, Mr. Burke, and Mr. Christensen, uh, just um, really taking a close eye, taking that long-range perspective, maintaining our financial principles that you put forward. Um, I, it gives me a lot of optimism that we can weather these types of clouds. I heard a lot about clouds tonight. So thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. We are adjourned until our 6 p.m. meeting.
the Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the Council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Hunt. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor McKenna. Here. Mayor Pro Tim Hunt. Here. Council Member Dunn. Here. Council Member Schaefer. Present. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Youth Liaison Dyer. Here. And Council Youth Liaison Agarwal. Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of November 15th, 2022. And I would just like to wish my mother a happy 89th birthday. Uh, this is the final call to submit speaker request forms. If anyone would like to address an issue that's on the agenda, or if you would like to speak regarding a non-agenda item, we have speaker request forms available in the lobby next to the speaker's podium or from the clerk. If you fill out the form and return it to the clerk, you will be recognized at the appropriate time. And the first item on the agenda is a presentation. This is recognition of Peoria Unified School District art educators. This is very near and dear to my heart. PUSD art educators have been an important part of advancing art in the city of Peoria. We have worked together on many programs such as the Young Artists Program, the Annual Arts and Cultural Festival, the Happy Valley Bridge Mosaic Project, and the Utility Box Art Wrap, just to name a few. Uh, the projects, the results of these projects have made substantial impact in the character of our city and the quality of life our residents enjoy. We've awarded students through the years, but we know who is the wind beneath their wings. And I didn't want to leave this office without thanking you for your commitment and dedication. Now, I would like to call to the podium Mary Lou Stevens, Director of Arts, Culture, and Library Services, and Rob Panzer, Director of Arts Education at PUSD. Thank you, Mayor Carlett. Mayor Carlett and members of the Council, it is such an honor to be here this evening as we take a moment to reflect and recognize the great partnership that we've established with the Peoria Unified School District, specifically in the arts program. The City of Peoria and PUSD have worked closely together to advance one of Council's livability goals of arts, cultural, and recreational enrichment. Public art is an essential component of our collective community pride, and it adds to the exceptional quality of life that we know and love here in Peoria. So a couple of examples the mayor already mentioned of some of the programs that we are very excited about is our award-winning utility box art wrap, which started with just four boxes up in the area of four of our elementary schools in Peoria, as well as our Happy Valley Bridge Mosaic Project. And as you can see, there was a wonderful classroom time with the artist as well for those students. And then of course, our arts and cultural festival that happens every spring. In addition, through Mayor Carlett's leadership and vision, the Mayor and Council's Young Artist Program, which is celebrated 
12 receptions over the last six years and honored hundreds of students from kindergarten through eighth grade for their amazing work. We recognize that none of this would have been possible without the dedication, talent, and support of our arts educators who are in the classroom every day influencing our future leaders. We have several arts educators with us this evening, and before we call each of them up to the, be recognized, I would like to ask POSD's Director of Arts Education, Mr. Robert Panzer, to say a few words. Mr. Panzer. Well, thank you, Mayor Carlot and Council. It certainly is a pleasure and an honor for us to be here and for the incredible partnership that, that we have together forged for, for many, many years. And, and certainly to our art educators who are in the audience tonight, uh, whether it's the Young Artists Program, the Arts and Cultural Festival, but also the, the art that's in our community that gives our community a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. um, your leadership has truly helped to shape the arts community in the city of Peoria. And I, I know I am personally grateful for that and uh, our artists and our art educators are grateful for that as well. And we have a number of them here tonight uh, to, to receive and to be part of that celebration with us together. So I cer certainly think we can start to call them down and, and let the celebration begin. Yes. Mayor, would you please join us in uh, celebrating our arts educators and come down with us? Thank you. So, so we have a number of educators with us tonight, and we'll start off with Ms. Kelsey Spears. Miss yep. Morgan Bailey. Mrs. Berta Walder. Mrs. Karen Sparks Kirkwood. Mrs. Christina Henderson. Mrs. Deb Adams. And Mrs. Sarah Scoggins. would certainly also be remiss if I would not acknowledge and thank Mrs. Justina Riley, who behind the scenes makes so much happen for our department in collecting the artwork, bringing the artwork together, and, and putting all of the pieces together. And I truly, and I know our educators are grateful for her as well. So thank you. Uh, the evening wouldn't be complete unless we also thanked uh, Justina Riley and Mr. Rob Panzer as well, so we have certificates for them also. Okay, time for the photo. Can you all get really friendly?
Mayor Carlot, I also wanted to personally thank you for the support that you have given to the Peoria District um, and to the community as well, and, and, and to myself in, in particular, uh, the support that you have done and the way that you have shaped the community through the arts and the sense of pride that our community has because of what they see with the arts in their community is truly because of your leadership. And, and I have a, a personal thank you for you, which is a piece of my artwork, a photograph that I took a number of years ago that I would like to, you to have and uh, you to. Oh, You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. here so it can be seen the whole rest of the meeting. Some things are very important. All right. Uh, let's see here. Where are we? Okay. Um, we have received a request to uh, reschedule item 7C from the consent agenda. And we will move that item to the January 3rd council meeting. And I will entertain a motion to accomplish that. I will motion that, Mayor. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Council, please vote on moving item 7C to January 3rd. And it passes unanimously. We will now move on to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed and or discussed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If the presiding officer receives a timely notice of a request for removal, an item may be removed from the consent agenda for consideration on the regular agenda. And uh, I have granted a request to remove items 9, 10, and 11 from consent to hear them on the regular agenda. Additionally, tonight's consent agenda includes items posted as a public hearing, that is item number 28C. If there's a member of the public present who wants to address a public hearing on the consent agenda and has completed a speaker request form, this item will be removed from consent and heard during the regular agenda. And I have received no speaker request forms. So is there a motion on the consent agenda with the exception of items 9, 10, and 11? So moved. Second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We will now move on to item number 9C, contract phase one, pre-design services, Archer Western Construction, CAP, LPP, intersection, Wellfield. Yay. Mr. Tyne, I know we've discussed this Wellfield many times as part of our water portfolio, and you were previously and publicly given budget authority for this project, and it was voted on and included in the final budget. Would you kindly go over it again? Y yes. <laughs> um, Mayor and Council, K Powers, our water services director, will uh, provide a, a presentation on the approval of the pre-designed services. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As you mentioned, Mayor, we've been before you, I think, probably eight times. Uh, in the past two years to talk about um, various water resources aspects and the need to gain additional access to uh, the water that we stored underground and in a worst case scenario, groundwater. And this project is a significant step in establishing that goal. Uh, the project was approved for approximately $10 million in the FY23 capital improvement program. The contract before you for consideration is approximately $2 million. There will be subsequent phases of this project and we'll bring those back to you for approval at a later date as it gets developed. Primary work is drilling up the seven test wells, small diameter, up to 1,500 feet deep, so that we can figure out how much water we have underground and the quality of it, to, so that we can use that information to design the rest of the system. 
Uh, staff selected Archer Western Design Build Team, which also includes Hazen Williams, or Hazen and Sawyer Engineering, I always mess that one up, uh, by utilizing a competitive process and city procurement guidelines. There were four design build teams that submitted for the project, and Archer Western was determined to be the best for, for the project based on past project experience and a whole host of other qualifications. Uh, permitting's gone pretty well, and we're actually expecting to start drilling in probably about a month. So we'll see if the schedule holds, but that's what the plan is for now. Um, Mayor and Council, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Council Member Dunn. So we spoke a little bit uh, before Council, and I just wanted you to um, explain um, for the public. Um, in my book, it says previous actions background. There are no previous Council actions on this project. The City uh, Attorney's Office, Materials Management Division, and Development and Engineering Department administratively approved and awarded all previous contractual items. So um, as we were talking, I was asking, you know, did this go out to IGA, which it, it did not, but there was another process. So I, I just, uh, in, um, so we can be transparent and let the public know how we came to this. Um, I, I just wanted to see how, you know, if it was, if it was an I, IGA, how did we come to that determination? Uh, thanks, you, Council Member Dunn, the Mayor and Council. So I'm looking over the documentation that we submitted for the previous actions, and all I note on my document is none. Um, I'm more than happy to go into how we selected the contractor. Um, basically, you put out a request for proposals, and the contractors develop project teams that oftentimes consist and required to consist this time of a, of a general contractor that can manage the overall contract and then a engineering a company that can do the specific design engineering work for it. Those people submit, a team gets formed up inside the city to review all of those applications. They take a careful look at all of the qualifications that they submit. They rank them and rate them and meet and talk about them and actually interview them, typically in the process, and I believe they did so in this case. And through that process, they rank them and pick the, the person that they, or the team that they think is best suited for the project based on the project specific characteristics. And then it's negotiation time to negotiate your way into a contract with them. That's the basic process. Council member, I'm, hopefully I've answered your question. So the team that um, met on this to um, let this, you know, go to this step, what was that comprised of it? Was it employees? Was it from the community? I don't recall exactly who was on this team. Typically, it's staff members. And then oftentimes, we try to grab an outside consultant that doesn't have an interest in the project or some sort of technical expert, depending on the project, and ask them to participate in it to provide an outside you know, resource and a view on it as well. I don't know that that happened on this one. I just, I'm sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head. Was there? Um, any reason why we didn't put it out for like a IGA or uh, like a low bid? Yeah. Is that what you're well, talking I about? I mean, I know low bid's not always the criteria. I get that, but is there any reason why we didn't put it out, you know, to the public? I think we did by advertising for a request for proposals. When you do that, you advertise it broadly and generally. How we advertise these things normally um, and put it out and. It was sort of a all comers. Feel free to, you know, turn in your qualifications for the project, and I think we received four of them in total, and those four were reviewed. And so staff made the determination that they were qualified and that we were getting a, a good value for our money. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, do we have a motion on item 9C? So moved. And we have a motion and a second, please vote. And it passes unanimously. All right, we will now move on to item 10C, which is contract Felix Construction Company, Greenway Water Treatment Plant, on-site hypochlorite generation product, project, excuse me. And I believe that that would be that's Kate me. again. <laughs> it is. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is an interesting project. Item 10C is a contract with Felix Construction Company to install um, on-site hypochlorite or chlorine generation uh, at the Greenway Water Treatment Plant. This is one of those projects that happens behind the gates. 
Um, we don't talk a whole lot about it, but it's absolutely necessary to provide healthy drinking water to our citizens. And it's essentially going to replace an existing um, method and means by which we supply chlorine to the plant. We normally haul it in in these big cylinders and, and transport it and store it and do all of that. And this will give us the ability to basically generate the chlorine on site. Uh, Felix Construction Company is what we call a job order contract contractor. Um, I'll review briefly how they were selected. So the job order contract process consists of similar to the previous project where you have a request for proposals and contractors are able to turn in proposals to become contractors on our, I'll call it on-call list, but that's not quite the right term. It's a job order contract list. Those folks are reviewed in detail for their qualifications and their ability to perform work. There's a whole host of um, things that are evaluated on. There's a committee that does this, usually made up of staff members. And then contractors selected uh, for the projects we anticipate coming up in future years. Uh, Felix Construction Company went through that process. And then after they got on that list, they were then later on selected to work on this specific project based on their specific uh, qualifications due to past work experience, specific staff. There could be a whole host of things that go into that. Sometimes it's just flat out availability. Um, and so they were selected and uh, have started the project or we'd, we'd like to get them started. Um, that's all I have. Happy to in your, answer any additional questions you might have. Council Member Dunn. Uh, this is the same thing uh, as we spoke. Um, you, you explained how we came to, to where we are on this. Um, my only question is, um, as far as the water treatment, um, this is mainly dealing with the, the chlorination. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, that's exactly right. We had chlorine in it to disinfect the water before you distribute it out into the system. We're actually required to do so by law. I know at one time um, when I went to the um, plant and you were there, uh, there was discussion about uh, nanobubble technology and some of that. Is that... Uh, stuff that we're using together with this, or is it separate? Yeah, it, exactly. Mayor and Council, it's, it's both of those. Chlorination, as far as and doing nanobubbles, is actually, you know, two different parts of the same treatment train. Uh, the nanobubble process you're talking about is where we actually put small, tiny bubbles of ozone into the, the stream of water coming in, in this case from the Salt River Project Canal, and it's primarily an algae control mechanism. Um, we don't like to use chlorine for that because it can cause disinfection byproducts and other problems. So injecting ozone is a preferred method. But at the back end of it, at the end of the plant, right before we distribute the water out into the system, we're required to use chlorine and maintain a chlorine residual throughout the system. Thank you for the explanation, Kate. Yep. All right. Is there a motion on item 10C? So moved. Second. Most in a second. Council, please vote. Passes unanimously. We'll now move on to item 11C, contract amendment, the White's Company, Municipal Fleet Maintenance Facility, 79th Avenue and Olive Avenue. Mr. Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. So this is an action on a contract amendment for design pre-construction for the Council approved uh, fleet maintenance project. And I'll pass it over to Adina Lund, our Development and Engineering Director. Hello. Um, we've been here previously a few times last year. We had a study session where we talked about the state of the fleet building and how much work is done at the existing fleet maintenance shop and the needs to do something about a building that was built 34 years ago. In May, we awarded a preliminary contract to a design build team. They went through the same process as Cape explained for the item number nine. Their first contract for $475,000 was to actually look at our site and make sure that we could build a new fleet building while still operating the fleet maintenance building that exists today. We were concerned about being able to build a new building, have all of the supplies on site and the workers, and making sure we could still maintain operations. So they went through that exercise and determined that we would be able to build a building. They sized the building to be 52,000 square feet with the possibility of expansion to 68,000 square feet. And so now we're asking to go forward with the final design of that building so that we can proceed and hopefully begin construction next fall. Of course, that will depend on supply chain. We may be back early for some early procurement items. Thank you. Councilmember Dunn? 
So basically, this is my understanding that it's just a change order to what we already have going on. Correct? Yes, it is a phased award. And so the first phase was more of the study, and then this is the final design. And like I said, we could be back for early procurement or just for the final construction cost overall. Okay, and it went through the same process as nine, so it didn't go out to bid, but we did an administrative uh, review of it and deemed that it was necessary and the Correct, steps that we it took. was through the public RFP process and then the team submit, and this team is one that has done similar buildings in different municipalities across the state. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, if, is I, there if I may, just one, yes. one clarification on that. So thank you. There are lots of questions regarding the procurement process. I think just as a reminder for uh, the audience, what we look at is, of course, we reach out to council, discuss various projects, identify the scope and the budget amount in the capital improvement project, then it's approved within the budget. Then we do have to come back to you for any contract approval, uh, meeting the certain criteria. One thing to mention with regard to bid versus an RFP, RFP is a more extensive process, a more extensive public process. So we do feel comfortable with this, but I do think this is, uh, brings up a very proud of our procurement efforts and the professionalism within that staff. If ever you'd like to have a study session to discuss this more, by all means, let us know and we'll make sure to clarify, because there's uh, it is a, a complex and there's a number of different delivery methods that we can apply. So happy to go into that more. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, is there a motion on item 11C? I'll motion. Second. The motion is second. Council, please vote. And item 11C passes unanimously. And we will now move on to new business and the regular agenda. And I am going to... Um, exercise the prerogative of the chair and move item 33R to the beginning of our regular agenda. Since we have some company, I thought it would be convenient for everyone involved. So we will begin with item 33R, implementation development agreement stadium point. Mr. Tai. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. As part of the stadium point development project, uh, we do have, uh, and consistent with the approval process that was outlined in the development agreement that you had seen, uh, this is an additional step that we have, and we'll have Katie Gregory, our deputy city manager, provide a presentation on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council, and good evening. Um, I do know we have a full agenda, so I will make this quick. Um, tonight's item is really the next step um, in the development of the stadium point at P83. It's an implementation and development agreement that was contemplated as part of the disposition, uh, development and disposition agreement that was approved by council uh, back in April of 2021. A quick recap on the project um, for our audience. Stadium Point is located on the 17 acres in the west parking lot of the Peoria Sports Complex. The site is currently used as parking for events at the stadium, but generally throughout the year it's underutilized um, and not used for other events. Um, the city partnered with Steinhauer Properties to create a high quality vertical mixed use development that exceeds all the, the best offerings in the region. The project includes among other things, um, a creation of class A office space offering a premier site for high wage employment for Peoria's talented workforce. And it's poised to be the city's first live work play development in the city. Um, the rendering you're seeing here is the most updated and, and approved um, rendering of the site plan. Um, so this is, in fact, what they're looking to create. Um, in, essence, uh, in April of 2021, the council approved the development agreement and established the terms and the conditions for the development of the site. So what am I here for tonight? Um, as part of that development agreement, the city and developer agreed that before they could take the next step that we would come back to the council to enter into an implementation agreement once they completed certain development requirements, their entitlements and some other development approvals. So really this implementation agreement that we're requesting council to approve does simply two things. Um, the first one is it creates the mechanism to enter into a government property lease and, it consider, and considering the size of this project and all the complexities that go into it, it recognizes the time needed to complete all the approvals. 
In order to enter into the implementation agreement, the city had to comply with all of the, the statute, statutory requirements um, of the government property lease laws. And as noted um, in the development agreement and then again restated in the implementation development agreement, the reimbursements through the government property lease, uh, the contemplated government property lease is limited um, to, the, to be utilized for certain public infrastructure for the city. So city infrastructure only that is part of any reimbursements through that mechanism. I would like to say that the uh, developer and their representative, or the developer representatives are here this evening, but staff would like to recommend that the council approve the implementation agreement, or development agreement between the city of Peoria and Stadium Point at P83, and I can answer questions. Thank you very much. And it is refreshing to look at those pictures. It's been a while. They're beautiful. And they are certainly going to um, increase the ability for us to have more employment in the city. We have been without Class A office space for far too long. It's going to be a game changer. So I'm very happy to see those pictures again. Um, Council, are there any questions or comments? Council Member Schaefer. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Katie, yes. good, good evening. I have a few questions about this. So Help me understand, I, I read through this, and what we're talking about really is the developer agreement was signed back in April 2021 that, that you stated, and this is part of the term, the implementation agreement. And within the implementation agreement is a uh, Giplet, and I looked up some Giplets in the last couple of days, and it looks like um, Tempe Town Lake uses 40 Giplets, and there's some in Glendale and Chandler as well. And so part of the Giplet is it, basically it's uh, eight years, or there is some I believe it's limited Giplet. So if you'd expand on that, and my understanding is we're talking about a parking lot today that generates zero revenue for the city in which we have to provide maintenance for. And then it's kind of a long-term investment is after the Giplet expires, um, then we'll be able to generate significant amount of revenue through taxes for the city in the upwards of millions of dollars. Is that correct? And then can you ex expand on the limited Giplet as well? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schaefer. Um, I am happy to expand on that. I, generally, what you said is correct. Um, the, when I talk about so, what I call a limited GPLET or a limited government property lease is that it is specific to certain public infrastructure items that have been uh, defined in the development agreement. So the reimbursements would norm, that would normally go for public infrastructure, this is just a mechanism, one of the mechanisms to help pay for public infrastructure that the developer is doing on behalf of the city. So that's when I say it's limited, it's limited to either the value of whatever that infrastructure is or um, up to the eight years um, that is allowable under the current statute. So, so Katie, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's, it's the, the public infrastructure or eight years or whatever comes first, is that correct? Yeah, the value of that public infrastructure or eight years. So if, the, if those values um, are met, um, then the GPLET would be done. We would be done with it. Excellent, thank you Katie for clarifying. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none. Council, is there a motion on item 33R? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Council, please vote. And, no, there are none. and it, it passes with one um, council member dissenting. We will now move on to our regular agenda, which is item 29R. This is a public hearing. Planned area development case Z22-02, Sierra Vista Medical Commons. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm Chris Hawkins, our planning director. We'll be able to provide a presentation on this. Great, thank you, Mr. Tyne, and, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, item 29R pertains to the southeast corner of Joe Max and Lake Pleasant Parkway. Uh, the case before us tonight is a rezone filed by Carolyn Oberholzer on behalf of Ergens. Ergens, they might be familiar. They've done some recent work in Peoria. If you think about the uh, Harbor Vista Medical Commons, Desert Harbor Medical Commons on Thunderbird and the Positive Rio area, they were the developer on those projects. So the applicant tonight is looking to rezone the site from Suburban, uh, Suburban Ranch, or SR43, to a planned area development for the purpose of facilitating a general office uh, development with potentially um, some ancillary commercial within the buildings. There are two buildings proposed on the site. In a minute, I'll show you the conceptual site plan. 
More particularly, the site is approximately 6.65 acres in size, and it's located at the signalized intersection of Lake Pleasant Parkway and Jomax. Um, as you know, this is an area of increased development pressure. The site itself is irregular and does have a wash that um, cuts through at the northwest portion of the site. You can see the wash kind of cutting through the area on the screen. Um, the edge conditions here are important. Um, the site does abut a church to the east, and to the south is a um, partially completed custom lot development called La Strada del Lago. And as you can see on the screen, there are currently um, undeveloped lots to the west and to the north of this site. A little bit about the land use disposition. Okay, this site was annexed in 1989. It was rezoned to the Suburban Ranch 43 in 1991. It's held that zoning since that time. SR 43 is, is essentially looked at as a holding zone. It's semi-rural uh, land uses, one acre lot minimum zoning, really until somebody comes forward to, with a project that implements the general plan. So what does the general plan say for the property? The general plan, of course, is the city's long-term vision for the site. Um, the site is designated as Office Local Commercial. Um, you can see on the left, that's the Office Local Commercial designation. So this is a designation on the lower end of the commercial intensity. So typically what we see here is office uses, medical uses, and other light commercial uses. And this corresponds with zoning districts that are on the lower end of the intensity scale when we look at it. The graphic here, this is the conceptual development plan. And uh, this is a plan that is as contemplated on the general plan map. Um, they proposed a medical professional office complex with potentially some supporting commercial uses. Think um, light retail, possibly a restaurant within the buildings here. There are two buildings on site. If you look at the uh, lower left-hand corner, that building A is um, proposed as one story up to 22 feet in height. It's approximately 85 feet from the southern boundary where that residential development is located. The building on the north, or building B, is approximately uh, 40 feet high, or two stories, and that's about 160 feet from Lake Pleasant Parkway. So um, I say approximately because the PAD does allow for some allowances for things like screening of mechanical equipment or elevator housings, things that can exceed uh, the uh, maximum height requirement. Um, the PAD also limits this to certain uses, essentially, additionally, a uh, professional medical office, light retail, and, and, and as I mentioned, uh, potentially a restaurant within the site. So a very limited usage. You're not going to see a drive through restaurant. You're not going to see gas stations, things like that. Those are a much different and heavier intensity. In terms of the traffic considerations, there are two points of access to the site along Lake Pleasant Parkway and Joe Max. Lake Pleasant Parkway is what we call a right-in, right-out um, access into the development, so there's no median cut there and no left out from the development. Um, and then on Joe Max, that will be a full um, access point, meaning there's all full movements that are permitted there. Um, both points of access will have right turn lanes that are required, both along Lake Pleasant and Joe Max Road. This graphic really briefly shows some renderings of the building character. This happens to be the one-story building along Lake Pleasant Parkway. Again, these are conceptual renderings. Um, if this project is approved, we'll go forward through the site plan and design process, and there could be some refinements to the, to the site plan and, and the elevations. As with any rezone, we do require a neighborhood uh, meeting and public outreach process. There was a neighborhood meeting on March 28th at uh, Copper Hills Church. There were nine attendees plus the applicant team and city staff. Um, comment topics that came up, people asked about what types of uses would be in the PAD. Um, there were comments about the building height, traffic generation, um, specific comments about trees in that landscape buffer, and then what's the timing of development? So as a result of the comments, um, there were some modifications to the entitlement that resulted from that. So building A, um, that, that's the building along Lake Pleasant, that was lowered from 30 feet to 22 feet to respond to some of those concerns. There was also a trellis screen that um, would be implemented on the south property line wall, just to provide some additional screening, uh, because the wall along the southern boundary does vary between 8 and 10 feet in height. And then also, as I mentioned, there was some discussion on, on the particular tree variety along the buffer, and so the neighborhood had suggested a tipu tree, which is a, is a nice shade tree, to be along the, the perimeter landscaping, so the developer w was able to uh, provide that as part of the site plan. As a result, the city has not received any um, opposition or support on this project. And so this staff out analysis in summary, this project does conform to the general plan office local commercial land use designation. It does advance several goals, including um, job generation, providing access to health and medical care services, 
And the PAD is one that has been um, customized for the context of the area. We talked about the building height, the, the land use listing that's limited, the landscape buffer, and again, they worked with the neighbors on some of the edge conditions there. Uh, next, the item did go to the Planning and Zoning Commission for a public hearing, and as you all know, we do provide notification at the start of the process and then prior to hearing. It goes to all property owners within 600 feet and all registered HOAs within a one-mile radius. The Planning Commission public hearing was held on October 20th, 2022. We did have one speaker that represented the neighborhood to the south, and the speaker spoke in uh, support of the case and did cite the, um, the working relationship with the applicant in terms of lowering the building height and introducing a trellis exhibit. And with that, commission was enthusiastic about the case, and they did vote five to zero, recommended approval based on that updated trellis exhibit as part of the PAD. So Mayor and Council, in closing, um, based on the findings that you see on the screen, the recommendation is to adopt the ordinance as recommended by staff and the Planning Commission. And with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Council, are there any questions for Mr. Hawkes? Council Member Schaefer? Thank you, Mayor. I don't have a question. I just kind of want to piggyback on some of the comments that Mr. Hawk has explained. This is a great example of a developer partnering with the community. Uh, the initial plans, the, the, the buildings were closer to the residents, and, and the developer listened to the residents, pushed them back. I think they moved the, the buffer from 30 feet to 60 feet, and they, they, building A went from two stories down to one story, and they put, they are, they're doing a 30-foot uh, screening of trees and the, and the trellis. And to the point that at planning and zoning, that one homeowner showed up and represent all the homeowners to the south, and they were all in favor of it. And then they also reached out to the church directly to the east to make sure that there was no impact on operational hours. So um, this is a great example of a, of a, a partnership with the, listening to the community and, and bringing, we're bringing healthcare, um, high paying healthcare jobs and healthcare services to our, our community. So this is a great project. Do I hear a motion in that? Mayor, when we're done making any comments, I would love to make a motion in favor. I see no other comments. I so move that we accept. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. I'll please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. We will now move on to item 30R, which is property acquisition for a regional retention basin, 75th Avenue and Golden Lane. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Adina Lund, our Development and Engineering Director, will provide a presentation on this. I do want to just make one comment that in the CC, I had inadvertently put in the wrong parcel number. I added an extra zero. <laughs> so in your packet, it says triple zero three E, which that parcel doesn't exist in the universe. So <laughs> that is incorrect. But everything else, the location is correct. So the parcel that we are talking about this evening is shown in red. It is located along 75th Avenue near Olive and Grand. You can see some arrows pointing towards the top of it. Those are arrows depicting some offsite drainage that enters the parcel. Those flows were originally identified in our Glendale Peoria <laughs> drainage plan, which was prepared in the 1980s. It was updated again in 2011 and 2014. Those offsite flows were caused by a lot of the regional roadways that were constructed in the area. It has never been a problem because the Rovies has, have farmed this area for a very long time. Farming parcels and t tend to act like basins. They have berms mm -hmm. around them. They have drainage canals. So when the flows would come in, it would just be held in the basin. As we have proceeded with developing the Peoria Logistics Park to the south, we have asked them to look at what would happen when we developed this parcel. So when looking at that, the city code would say that the flows that are entering the parcel would leave, they would have to be managed through the parcel. So if those flows coming in came out where there's a low spot, that's right at Golden Lane near Peoria Industrial Park to the left. Well, the Peoria Industrial Park was not designed to take those flows. At the time it was constructed, Golden Lane did not exist and no flows were able to get to the site. ADOT has constructed Golden Lane as part of the Olive Avenue frontage to Grand so we would be in a little bit of trouble if all of a sudden those flows were released in that direction. So that is why we are here tonight. 
my long story long. So the key items that are in this agreement would be purchasing this 20.75 acres of land for $3.5 million. It was appraised at $4.75 million. Van Trust, who is developing the Peoria Logistics Park, has agreed to sell it to us for their price because they are buying a larger portion of Rotary property. They are getting it at a better price and passing that on to us. The drawing you see here is a drawing that was done by their engineers that show what a regional basin could look like and that there would be room for a future possible city facility. It is designated in the agreement that that city facility would be for non-public uses, but could be an expansion of services that we have at our MOC. Parking areas, storage, industrial type uses. Another thing in the agreement is that we would maintain an easement for the irrigation for the farming that still exists to the south until such time as that land is developed. And those are the main points of the agreement that we have tonight. I am requesting approval to purchase the 20.75 acres for the $3.5 million. I have $1.5 million in an account for storm drain land preservation, which is an account that we use when these opportunities come up where we have something identified in our drainage plan that we need to act on. But I need an additional $2 million that would come from the city contingency account. So that is my request tonight. Do you have any questions for me? I have a question, Adina. So I understand that, that drainage has to be managed or maintained on site, but I don't understand how we could put anything other than a passive use on it. You're talking about building a, an actual building, possibly. How does that happen in a, in a retention basin? So we would be asking through the CIP to do a study next year. And the study would look at a variety of options. When we do our capital projects, we like to look at different opportunities. So one would be to look at doing a shallow basin that takes up the whole entire parcel, which would mean no development. Mm -hmm. But as shown in this picture, as the developer had shown, there's the chance of doing a deeper basin so you could realize that value in an additional building area. And so that's something that for the city to consider just as we run out of space for future expansion as our city continues to grow. It's an area that's near our MOC, so that's favorable to us because we already have an operation down there. So it's something that we want to consider because trying to find any vacant land to buy is very difficult. And we don't want to take the land away from a developer. So all the, the what I'm looking at in black and white there would be deeper than what's in purple. Correct. correct? It would be a very deep basin that would be fenced off. I see. We figure in an industrial area, there wouldn't be a lot of use for it. Sometimes we like to do the shallow basin so that the surrounding community can activate it, but it's all industrial in the area. So yeah. we didn't see that as being a huge benefit, but that's part of the study so that we can consider those items. Great. Thank you. Is there any um, questions or comments, Council? All right. Seeing none, then can I have a motion? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is 31R, Code Amendment, Chapter 21, Water Saving Landscape Changes. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And this is a recommendation to adopt a, a new ordinance as recommended by staff and approved by Planning and Zoning Commission. And Chris Hawkins, our Planning Director, will provide presentations. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Tyne, and good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm gonna make, uh, offer a few opening comments, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Cody Gleason. He's a principal planner with the department to talk about the changes we're talking about this evening. So as you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussions over the last year about challenges on the Colorado River and persistent drought conditions. Kate Powers, he's been, him and his department have been frequent uh, guest speakers here to talk about those concerns and those challenges. As part of the drought management plan, um, the city departments, we've all endeavored to find areas where we can facilitate sensible water changes. So tonight what we're going to be talking about is a targeted amendment to the landscape code. So the landscape code, this is the code that identifies the planting requirements when we have new developments that come into the city. So this amendment is intended to offer practical changes that will result in meaningful water savings and a healthier growing environment. But we want to do this in a manner that we do not impact or impede our shade goals or our goals for having a, a great aesthetic development environment. So Cody, he's been working with this Pretoria Castor in the Water Services Department and trying to identify what those sensible adjustments could be. So 
Um, I won't provide too much, but as a teaser, he does have some real life examples to show you and quantify for you what those water savings could be. And also on the, on the back end, what the kind of uh, capital outlays savings could be for the developer. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Cody. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Mayor and Council, thank you for having me. Uh, Chris stole a little bit of my thunder, but hopefully it'll still be a good presentation for you. Um, so just in reference to um, what we're talking about here, you know, I, I know council is familiar with it, but perhaps a little bit for the public, uh, a little bit of information. About 53% of our current water supply comes from the Colorado River. And I also wanted to give a little bit of background and perspective as to how we end up utilizing that water supply. So. Um, as you can see here, about 21% of it goes towards commercial landscaping, and then 70% um, of it is residential use. Now, how do we use that residential use? About 54% of that residential use uh, goes towards outdoors, so things like landscaping. So uh, as you're all acutely aware of um, the Colorado River situation and uh, the uh, drought and water shortage, the Colorado River and Lake Mead are currently at a stage 2A. Um, we anticipate um, through my education from the Water Services Department that um, we would likely be shifting to a stage 3 um, drought de declaration in 2024. With that, and as a result of uh, Peoria's efforts to be a good steward with our, with our uh, water management, we've enacted a drought management plan, and as a part of that, we've transitioned to stage one, which is water watch. Uh, what that means is really we're trying to lead by example. We're trying to identify where city departments can make cuts of 5% or, you know, if possible, uh, more than 5% and then encourage the community to follow along. So with that, we wanted to identify what is the low hanging fruit within the landscape ordinance. If we're utilizing, you know, really a majority of our water supply on outdoor um, items such as landscaping, how can we transition that to where we're even more water conscious than we are now and make sensible practical changes? So. We did those in a, a variety of uh, places within this section in the zoning ordinance. And really what it comes down to is modification of planting ratios and then some design elements within the landscape code. So obviously, first and foremost, we wanted to focus on water usage, uh, obviously lowering demand um, by modifying what our standards require. And something to note is in no way does this impact uh, currently existing sites. They would be able to retain any landscaping on site. This is just modifying our minimum requirements. So folks can choose to plant above that. We would encourage them not to, uh, but we certainly would allow for them to go above and beyond. Um, in addition to that, we wanted to evaluate, okay, if we're making these changes to the planting ratios and other design elements, what are the other benefits that we can make sure and include and retain? So we wanted to identify items such as plant health. If we're changing it, we want to ensure that we're providing healthy landscaping. And then of course, shade. We want, we want to be able to provide shade over the site and particularly in pedestrian oriented areas. Kind of a tangent um, you know, uh, benefit to that is we end up lowering developer costs, and uh, as you'll see when we get into the examples, is we're retaining the aesthetics that we have within our community, we're lowering the water demand, and ultimately we're lowering the cost for developers. So um, this is just some preliminary information with respect to how we come up with the, the numbers that we do. Uh, tree, shrub, and ground cover water use on an annual basis and then the developer cost associated with each of those plant elements. Um, and we worked with developers to get their actual numbers uh, with the exception of ground cover, that's me Googling. <laughs> so we wanted to give you a, an aesthetic uh, picture of what it actually looks like in the field. And uh, keep in mind, I am not an architect, so 
it, it's about as good as it's gonna get as far as a visual standpoint. But what we're trying to show is on the left you have our existing standard, on the right you have the proposed. Largely it's the same aesthetic. What we're doing is modifying the uh, basically square footage ratio and the shrub ratio that's applied to that. And you'll see that uh, reduction in shrub theme as we continue on. And what that is is you're getting a, an incrementally lower benefit for shrubs. You're getting less carbon sequestration, uh, you're getting proportionately more water use, and you're not getting any shade out of it. So here, again, we have a reduction in uh, the number of shrubs per ratio, but we also cut in half the ground cover, and again, ground cover is like a diminished shrub, so think of things like uh, lantana that you find uh, along the street frontage, so we're basically cutting that in half. Uh, landscape buffers, uh, what council often sees uh, landscape buffers for are two dissimilar zoning districts. So for instance, when you have commercial adjacent to single family residential, you'll typically have a landscape buffer. For instance, the uh, Cielo Vista case that you just saw, that landscape buffer on the south end. We have a higher planting ratio for that. And the reason being is we wanna provide some level of screening and aesthetic uh, to prevent um, or mitigate factors between those dissimilar uses. So as you can see, really the aesthetic, again, doesn't change here. So real world example, we took those uh, preliminary numbers that I showed you a minute ago, and we applied those to an actual site that uh, recently received site plan approval so that we could have an apples to apples comparison of how does this change things for them. And ultimately what happens really again with the same visual, you're saving over half a million gallons a year on this one commercial site. Um, in addition to that, we end up saving the developer about uh, $122,000 uh, of capital investment on the front end. Obviously there's ongoing uh, savings through things like maintenance because they don't have so many shrubs. Um, but that key number there that is the uh, 122,000. And we applied this to a couple of different sites, not only this retail center, but also industrial, and then kind of a different formatted site. And we came up with relatively the same numbers based on scale for those developments as well. So in summary, uh, what we're looking to do is really modify or reduce the shrub count for various ratios within our landscape code, uh, limit turf uh, in order to align it with our design guidelines that identify um, open space requirements. So our open space would be 10%. This would just be seeking to align the turf maximum with that open space. So you have usable turf rather than turf that is along the street frontage because we don't really want kids playing along the street. And then in addition to that, uh, one of the uh, key items really is requiring that the plantings be low water use plants. So um, think of your desert adapted plants rather than um, plants that are uh, natural to say the east coast that would require more water. As a result, uh, staff finds that the proposed amendment would provide a practical change to the landscape code. And in addition to that, um, obviously first and foremost, looking at water savings and really the health of the plants on site. As a result, staff recommends approval of ordinance 2022-24. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Would you mind going back to the previous slide for a second? Um, can it be all plants? Okay, so reduce ground cover, I get, limit turf from 20% to 10%. Now, did, you, did I hear you right that that was only along the roadways where that limitation was gonna happen? Uh, mayor and council, that would be for the entire site. So right now we currently have a maximum of 20% over an entire project area. This would be modifying that from 20% to 10%.
And really where we often have the most turf use is within single family residential um, HOA tracks. And we wanted to be able to have those play areas for folks to be able to go and recreate. And at the same time, not really extend out to places like the street frontage where um, oftentimes you get overspray on the street and really it doesn't serve as a functional area for anyone. So we're not going to limit, we're not going to um, decrease the amount of open space that we are requiring. They, they just can't put turf on all of it. Mayor and council, that's correct. We are not modifying the open space requirements. This would align with those open space Good. requirements. Okay, and I really appreciate that you're not getting rid of any trees because if anything, we need many more trees for shade, um, but we can, of course, look for man-made shade in lots of different ways still. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, is there any comments? I, people keep holding their hands out like they're gonna press a button. Ah, Micah? Yes, just to see if I have this right. So is this just if uh, the city of Peoria will provide a recommendation to new developments? and providing a recommendation to land uses and single family residential, but not necessarily a requirement for those to decrease their water usage already. Uh, Mayor, Council, uh, Youth Liaison Dyer, uh, basically we're modifying the requirement. So we're providing a minimum threshold that developers have to meet. They can extend beyond that if they so choose um, and provide, you know, uh, a more lush landscape uh, environment or approach to their development. But ultimately, we're just modifying what that minimum level of uh, landscaping would be. Okay, thank you. Thank you, anyone else? All right, do I have a motion? So moved, Mayor. Second. <clears throat> Please vote. It passes unanimously, thank you. Next item on the agenda is 32R, Juneteenth, as a city observed holiday. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. And this is a request for City Council to uh, adopt an ordinance amending uh, Chapter 1, Section 112 of the code related to city observed holidays. And with us is Christine Nickel, Human Resources Director, to discuss the Juneteenth city holiday proposal. Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for the opportunity to present to you this evening. Um, tonight, I will provide a brief overview of the history of Juneteenth, along with information on federal and local observations. On June 19, 1865, federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas, to take control of the state and free those who were enslaved. The arrival of federal troops came two years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. June 19th, Juneteenth, short for June 19th, is also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, and Black Independence Day, and is the oldest nationally celebrated commemoration of ending slavery in the United States. The first Juneteenth was celebrated after the announcement in 1865, and the following year, it organized into the first celebration of freedom. In the ensuing dec decades, Juneteenth commemorate commemorations feature music, prayer, barbecues, and other activities. In June 2021, President Biden signed a resolution establishing Juneteenth as a federally recognized holiday. The holiday is currently observed by several Valley municipalities, including Avondale, Buckeye, Chandler, Goodyear, Phoenix, Tempe, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tolleson. The recognition of Juneteenth as an observed holiday demonstrates the city of Peoria's commitment to fostering a diverse community and workforce. This concludes the presentation. Your vote to adopt resolution 2022-25 will result in an amendment to city code and the observance of Juneteenth as an official city holiday. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Council, do we have any questions or comments? Seeing none, can I have a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. Motion and a second. Council, please vote. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is 34R, Memorandum of Understanding, United Phoenix Firefighters Association, Local 493. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And we ask Ms. Nickel to 
not go far as she uh, offers the presentation and she has some uh, very special guests with us as well. Very special guest, huh? Special. Who could it be? <laughs> Thank you once again. Uh, joining me this evening to my left is Brianne Nelson, HR manager and lead negotiator. And to my right, a familiar face to you all, Hunter Claire, who is a fire captain and PFFA president. We are pleased to come before you this evening to provide you with an update on the meet and confer process and to provide a proposed memorandum of understanding for your consideration. PFFA represents 198 employees in three job classifications, firefighter, fire engineer, and fire captain, providing superior public service to those that they serve. The city of Peoria and PFFA have an excellent working relationship, and the meet and confer process really highlights this relationship and the ability to work together, prioritize, and come to a mutually beneficial agreement. We are pleased to present you this agreement tonight that shows both the city's commitment to um, remaining an employer of choice and commitment to the employees and PFFA's commitment to continuing to provide that superior public service. The current agreement with PFFA that we are currently in um, runs from July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of 2023. If approved, this memorandum of understanding would go into effect July 1st, 2023. We would like to take just a moment to recognize the members of the negotiating team on your screen. Uh, without all of the hard work, um, both before the formal negotiations began, during, and in follow-up after, I'm sure there will be lots of collaboration as well, we wouldn't be here this evening. So thank you um, sincerely for all of the work that went into it, and we really truly believe that this is a, an agreement that's in the best interest of all parties. I'll provide a little bit of information on the process and the steps that we've taken to date. The meet and confer process began in early summer of 2022 with city staff conducting a wage survey from local jurisdictions. Following the wage survey, a general review of the MOU and language cleanup was conducted. The formal process kicked off here before you in a joint presentation with both city staff and PFFA presenting, and then negotiations really progressed quite steadily until then and resulted in a ratification of the agreement by the PFFA members on November 9th. The next two slides provide an overview of some of the more significant items you will see in the proposed agreement. In year one, there will be a 9% market adjustment to the salary range and the employee pay. Additionally, the employees will receive their step increase as prescribed in the MOU. That's their annual merit-based step increase. Also in year one, all employees will receive a one-time lump sum payment in the amount equivalent to 4.5% of base wages, and that will be in one-time monies. A portion of the one-time funds will be directed to a post-retiree health care account, and I'll get into a little bit more on that on the next slide. For the two, year two of the agreement, all employees will receive a 2% cost of living adjustment. And that's really important because it, coupled with the market adjustment in year one, helps Peoria kind of keep pace with the market and provides a, an increase to all employees early in the contract year um, to their pay and to the pay range. We believe that this will assist the city in keeping pace with the rate of inflation and provide increases that are fiscally sustainable. In addition to wages, other key items were negotiated and are listed on this slide. Although the list is not exhaustive of all of the items that were negotiated or all of the changes that come with this new MOU, it does illustrate that we have done much work in reaching an agreement with PFFA that is reflective of the priorities of both parties, as I earlier mentioned. With this agreement, PFFA will join and contribute to a post-retirement health care trust, and the city will provide a matching contribution to that trust to be utilized for post-retiree health care costs. Through our survey late, uh, mm -hmm. early, la early last summer, we discovered that paramedic specialty pay was a bit out of alignment for the market, so you'll see that adjustment in the contract as well. And finally, the MOU includes maintenance of one additional floating holiday that carries over from the last agreement. This concludes the city's presentation. With this agenda item, we are seeking approval of item 34R, approving the memorandum of understanding with PFFA uh, to go into effect July 1st, 2023. 
Um, I thank you for your time and your support throughout this process. I'd like to pass the time now to Hunter, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions after he speaks. Thank you, Christine. Mayor, Council, uh, first let me start by apologizing for this growth on my face. It is No Shave November, and my fiance seems to love it. A lot of you in here look great with it, me not so much, so I apologize for that. But <clears throat> to start out, we just want to thank uh, Christine and her team. We know, Brianne, this is your first time to our negotiating table, which had to start a little bit later than we normally would be able to, but it still shows the effectiveness of the teamwork that we have and the relationships that our organization has been able to build with all departments in the city to get this done so quickly. We want to extend a, a thank you to City Manager Tyne and his team, my boss's boss back here, Mr. Andy Granger, and I know there's a lot of people that work behind the scenes there. Um, the team that's behind me, Josh Manning is the member here. He has a very beautiful mustache compared to myself. Mm -hmm. But um, the, all of our people that put in work, some of them are on duty today. Others are at home taking care of their new and expanding families that we had. So congratulations to Isaac and his family members out there um, on their new child. And then lastly, we just want to thank the mayor and council. We know a lot of you we've had for a long period of time. Some of your tours are coming to an end here, as we would say in our career. But, you know, there's a lot of things that come across your desk um, for the last almost 18 years right now. Uh, some of you hit and miss between some of our youth council that are only here for the year. You know, you're a part of a lot of this and you get to see the amazing things that our council is able to do and the city officials that we have in these places that have helped to build our city into a great place that people want to work, live, and raise their families at. And that's no different for us here on the fire service. So we just really want to thank you for taking into the considerations that we had coming into this contract, um, trying to bring us up into the market, which we had fallen out a bit of, um, we know there's other areas that are looking to negotiate, but I think that this will hopefully help us retain the best and some of those cities that are actively working to steal away our <laughs> hard-earned members. Uh, we think that this should help to stop them from that. So, But again, thank you. We know there's a lot of things that come across what's best for the city, our employees, and most likely the, the people that we serve from this. We can't thank you enough for you know that dedication to everything that goes there to keeping our citizens safe. So thank you very much. Is, is that your presentation? It's a really good one. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And I just have to have to thank PFFA. Um, you have just shown your your compassion and your empathy that you show to our residents. You you displayed that again during these negotiations. Always thinking about what's in the best interest of both parties, the city as well as your association. So thank you so much for being such a great partner. We. Um, we are very happy to make sure that your wages um, make, your, make your, all of your employees able to take care of their growing families and their growing facial hair as well. <laughs> <laughs> so to all of you, and congratulations on your, your first negotiations. We appreciate all the work that you did. Uh, thanks to all of you again. So with that, I will take a motion on item 34R. So moved. We have a motion in many seconds. Please vote. And it passes. I'm sorry, is that a Danette Dunn? Is she gone? Yeah. Oh, it passes with all the people who are present <laughs> unanimously. Thank you. Um, we will move on to item 35R, contract, Red Point Contracting, Reclaimed Water Project 1, Segment 4. Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I appreciate <laughs> that. And thank you, Ms. Lund, for uh, coming down. Uh, this is Adina Lund, our Development Engineer and Director, who will provide a presentation. This is the last time you'll see me tonight. <laughs> I was expecting you to be Cape Powers. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was here five weeks ago to talk about Reclaimed Water, Project 1, Segment 3. So this will be a very brief review of what we talked about 
back then. Also, I want to thank Cape and Cody for talking all about water tonight. So everybody has a, a good refresher as to why reclaimed water is so important to the city. The situation with the CAP and the drought is a big portion of why we are here trying to figure out how to deliver reclaimed water to our city rights of ways and parks and trying to water all that landscaping to free up potable water for all of us to drink in the future. So this project one is a total of seven miles long. It was broken into four various segments. Segment one is already completed. Segment two was previously awarded and will start construction in January. That's the green section. Segment three, the red section, is what I was here for in October. That will be starting construction in summer of fall of 2023. And segment four is the final segment that we are here to talk about tonight. And that segment lagged behind because we were getting some easement rights from state land. We were perfecting some easements and that took some time. So this is a close up version of segment four, just to put you in the right space at Rose Garden Lane, 109th Avenue, going over to 107th Avenue up to Pinnacle Peak. We did go through a low bid procurement process. We had four bidders that bid on the project. The average bid was $5.1 million and Redpoint was the low bit bidder who was just a little hair over 5.0 million. The construction schedule, if you approve it tonight, it will still unfortunately take nine months to 10 months to procure the pipe. So we will not see them out there doing work until fall of next year. And then we anticipate that the entire project would be completed by summer of 2024 to begin delivery of that reclaimed water, which is very important to all of us. I am asking tonight for you to award the contract to Red Point for $5 million. And I also am asking for a budget amendment in the amount of $6.4 million. We talked about this at the last meeting that we had run out of funding for the overall project one. We had gotten approval to sell bonds to cover that amount. And so that was where the $6.4 million came from. So while we only need $5 million, plus we need contingency for this segment, <laughs> we're asking to deposit the full amount into the project because that is what we had originally sold the bonds for and where the money should remain until it is no longer needed. Once we're done with the project, any contingency amount would then be returned and budget would have to find a new place to spend that money. So that is what I'm asking for tonight. Do you have any questions for me? Mr. Schaefer? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Adina, just two quick questions. First of all, is Red Point doing any other sections of the pipe? And the reason I ask that is because with the delay in getting pipe, because you know we, we know the economic impact that we have right now, but is there any, can we scale that to get some of the pipes ahead of time since we're already currently in flight with the other phases? And that's the reason I ask about Red Point. Right, thank you for that question. Um, the other two segments that are getting ready to start, those are being done by FPS. They were the low bidders. This red point is a new person to Peoria, but not entirely new. They have done some private development projects and they have done work in other municipalities. So we're actually looking forward to getting to know another new player. But they all have only three different pipe companies in the United States to go to. So with that, that's why we end up with the same time frames, unfortunately. So, but we continue to work with them. They are, all the companies have been very willing to submit their submittals. We go through those right away. And once we get those submittals approved, that's when they can actually place their order. So they've been very quick to do that as soon as the council has approved the contract. So we really appreciate them working with us. And they continue to call the suppliers and kind of beg and ask for updates because you never know when some other project could get canceled and we could benefit from that. Yeah, that's the question. It was with the project in, in flight right now and us ordering pipe, but didn't know if we can scale that in any way and speed up the, some of that lag on the timeline. So thank you, Adina. Anyone else? I would just like to thank you for continuing in the face of all of our inflation and, and supply chain issues, continuing to move this project forward. I see summer of 2024, I wrote it down, so now it can't move, it has to be that date, no farther. Hopefully sooner, um, these water efficiencies are just so, so important to our city. Um, and I appreciate all that you're doing to keep this moving. I know it's not an easy one. <laughs> but it is a game changer for us. So, could I have a motion, please? So moved. Have a motion second. and a second. Please vote. 
And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is call to the public for non-agenda items, and I have received no speaker request forms. So we will now move on to reports from city manager, Mr. Time. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Just two quick items. First, we wanted to show a short video of the upcoming special events, including over here the Fir Tree Theatrical Performance that will be in Centennial Plaza, as well as the Old Town Holiday Festival, of course, and our Polar Plunge. Um, so we'll hear that. Thank you. Great shots. Thank you very much, and thank you to the communications office as well for putting that together. So some exciting items out of our arts, culture, and library services department. Uh, last item, I had a special thanks from staff, and this is in recognition that this is our last full agenda meeting for the year 2022. And so uh, in doing so, probably a good time for us to ta uh, stop and take stock of all that you've done. I, I wish I'd made a massive list, but just to think that uh, with your assistance, City Council, we've added a six ambulance. We've done major technology improvements, in including our constituent relational management system, the police dashboard as well. Of course, we've had numerous conversations about the expansion of our reclaimed water system, which uh, the timing couldn't be more relevant, as we know, with, uh, with the uh, conditions on the Colorado River. The important coordination of the Council uh, with all of our regional agencies, and so many of you have worked so hard and tirelessly to help represent Peoria and working with our staff on that to really move uh, the importance of uh, representing our citizens and the region effectively has been just outstanding, uh, as well as a number of other coordinated activities that go on. And so just on behalf of your staff, we want to thank you again for the wonderful partnerships that we've had uh, in what was truly a great year. So that is all I have. Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? <laughs> this is the last one of the year, the last full one. And so we want to say back to you that Peoria has the finest staff in, in the state. I would, I would say at least in our state, if not more. And we are just so fortunate and so blessed to be able to accomplish so much because of your professionalism and your knowledge and your transparency and your willingness to share information with us all the time and to always take great care of our residents. Thank you very, very much. And so, I, Avi, are you still on the phone? Yes, I'm present. Well, I am going to move on to reports from Youth Council liaisons. Would you like to go first? Of course. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Third off work exposing our issue survey to all Peoria youth through uh, flyers, newsletters, and announcements in schools. So far, with the results we've gotten, uh, mental health and stress management have been a top issue for a large majority of the students and youth who have filled out the survey. And these results crucial in starting our future action. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Micah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a few things that I'd like to report. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be sending seven of our uh, Youth Advisory Board members to represent um, our group in the city of Peoria in Kansas City for the Cities and Towns Conference that's uh, going to happen this week. And in the past few weeks, we've had the honor to continue helping out the city of Peoria at the Veterans Day event and at this past second Saturday. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks for all that you do, both of you. 
And um, I would just like to say thank you for allowing me to serve you for these last 18 years. And with that, we are adjourned.